Okay, now we have one more question for you. Can I ask a question about the question? Yes. Electric field is uniform? Not necessarily. I mean, we have an arbitrary electric field configuration and we just put a positive charge in this electric field. It can be uniform, it might be non-uniform. Okay, there are just 30 students who send their answers. Okay, just probably five or ten of you, your phones doesn't work. So the rest, I'm still waiting for your answers. And if you have given the answer, make sure that your friends sitting next to you or behind you or in front of you, they also give the same answer.
Well, before discussing this question, let's, let's discuss one more question. It is almost the same question, but instead of a positive charge, you have a negative charge. So what, does anything change in this case, or if yes, what changes? Ne kullanıyorsun? Türksel mi ya? Veya... Türksel de var. Senin de mi Türksel? Türksel. Okay, does anybody who is using the Turksal network, can you manage to send your replies? No? Turksal, yes. Who, yes? Which ones of you can send your replies even though you are using Turksal? Okay, who can send your replies with Turksal phones? Okay, you can. Okay, I will... Okay, so I will also stop at this one over here. Let's say in this one, the majority... Oh, there's a large spread. Let's get the previous one. Okay, let's start with this one. Well, most of you have got the right answer. Whatever system you have, if you leave the system to itself from rest, uh, it will always move to a configuration that has a lower potential energy because you start from rest zero kinetic energy due to the forces that, uh, that act on various parts of the particles they will be moving around so they will gain kinetic energy but since energy should be conserved if the kinetic energy increases the potential energy should be decreased so if you just uh, release your system from rest it always goes to uh, the lower potential energy configuration so the lower potential energy is B or D. Well, it's a positive charge, the change in the potential energy is equal to the charge multiplied by the change in the potential, electric potential, but the charge is positive, so since the change in the potential energy 
is uh, negative, it causes a lower potential energy. The change in the uh, electric potential should also be negative, it goes to a lower poten electric potential. So it goes to a lower electric potential and lower potential energy. You remember that minus sign that we put in the definition? Yes. Because of that. The force, you see, the force is always in the direction of lowering potential energy. And because of that minus sign, the force will always try to lower the potential energy. And well, the same holds for the, no. Well, why did we? Because somebody in the history of science preferred this convention. <laughs> why exactly did we just choose the universe as zero energy? Now, we didn't choose the universe as zero energy. It turned out that the universe has almost zero energy. How do you find this out? By measurement, by observation. Now, we know that the universe has almost zero energy, if not exactly zero. That's measurement. We didn't choose it. Uh, so in this second question, we had a larger spread. But you see, whatever the system is, the systems will always go to a lower potential energy. So that is kind of restricts our answers to either D or B. It always goes from a higher to a lower potential energy. Now the potential is kind of different. The potential is related to potential energy by this charge. So if you put a minus <coughs> charge, and we know that uh, it goes through a lower potential energy, so that uh, the change in the potential energy is negative. But the change in the potential energy is the charge multiplied by the change in the potential. But the charge is negative, the cha potential the energy change in the potential energy is negative, so the change in the electric potential has to be positive. So that negative charge always goes from a lower potential to a higher potential. Or you can also think of it in, the, in another way. You have a negative charge, so it will always move in the opposite direction to the electric field. But the opposite direction of the electric field is the direction in which the potential energy increases fastest. So it always, the negative charge always goes to a point where which has a larger potential energy, larger potential, sorry. Okay, any questions on this electrostat uh, equipotential surfaces? <coughs> now let's look at this potential and potential energy concepts in a bit more detail. Let's just take two charges, Q1 and Q2. We had, see, we had calculated the potential energy of this system, and we said that u is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q1 times q2 over r. r is this distance. Now, which I can also write as q1, 1 over 2, q1 times 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q2 over r, plus 1 over 2, Q2 times 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q1 over R. Do you agree? I mean, I didn't do anything. I just divided this into two equal terms. That's why I have this 1 over 2 and 1 over 2. And in one of them, I just factored out Q1. In the other one, I factored out Q2. But the reason why I did this factorization is this is equal to 1 over 2 Q1, but this is nothing but the potential created at the point of Q1. Let's say, let's call that R1 due to the other charge. Plus 1 over 2 Q2, and this is nothing but the potential created at the position of Q2 by the other charge. 
V of R2. Let's try to generalize it a bit more. So we would like to write, I mean, we already know that if you bring one additional charge to your system and put it, let's say, at this point, then we know that the potential energy of the system is increased by the, pot by the potential at that point created by the other charges that are already pre present times the charge of your system. So that we already know. But let's say we already have all the charges. So how can we calculate the potential energy of all the charges? Ah, this is kind of nice. This is kind of symmetric also. So if you want to calculate, this tells me that if you want to calculate the potential energy of your configuration, just say, uh, go over each one of your charges, multiply that charge by the potential at that point, created by all the other charges, divide by two and sum them up. This will be a simpler expression for us. Let's try to do a similar thing for three charges. Q1, Q2, and Q3. And we had already calculated the, this potential energy. Let's call this distance R12. This is R13, R23. So we had calculated that the potential energy, now we, all, we considered all possible pairs and wrote the potential energy for each one of those pairs. So this was equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q1, Q2 over R12, plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q1, Q3 divided by R13, plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q2, Q3 divided by R23. This, this was what we had obtained by just bringing all the charges one by one from infinity. This is equal to, let's try to write it in, the pre, in this form, 1 over 2, let's say Q1, times 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q2 over R12, plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q3 over R13. At least now I have half of this term, half of that term. The other half should, be, should come from the other terms. Plus 1 over 2 Q2 times 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Q1 over R12 plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Q3 times R23. Okay, now I have... This first term is just this term plus this term. Half of it is here, half of it is over here. Plus 1 over 2 Q3, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q1 over R13, plus Q2 over, no, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q2 over R23. Now I have everything. Now this term plus this term gives me this term, this term plus this term gives me this term, the remaining two terms gives me this term. So I have an equality over here. But again, if you look at this expression, this is nothing but the potential created at the point Q1 by the other charges. This is the potential created at the position of Q2 by the other charges, and this is the potential created by the, uh, at the point of Q3 by other charges. Which one? This one. Well, because this term, I have both here and here. I am just dividing each one of these terms as into two, and I write them twice. So that's why I always have this one over two. Otherwise, I, I will be kind of double counting. Q1, V at the point R1 plus 1 over 2 Q2, V at the point R2, plus 1 over 2 Q3, V at the position R3. In fact, this is the potential energy for any charge distribution. You can just write it like this. And 
And we can even proceed and say that, okay, let's take some conductors. Let's say this has charge Q1, this has charge Q2, this has charge Q3. We measure their potential, this has potential V1, this has potential V2, this has potential V3. Now, we don't know how the charges are distributed on the conductor. We don't need to know that because we know that every conductor is an equal potential surface. So all the charges in this conductor have the potential V1. All the charges in this conductor have, are at the potential V2. And all the charges in this conductor are at the potential V3. So we can just write down the total energy of the system. 1 over 2 Q1 V1 plus 1 over 2 Q2 V2 plus 1 over 2 Q3 V3. And in this case, at least, the conductors are not even point charges. But they are just, each conductor is just a collection of point charges. So this will be the energy stored in my system, the potential energy of my system of charges on conductors. Now this will be an important property that we will be using next week. The energy stored in an in arbitrary charge distribution, as long as they are on conductors. Now any questions on this one? Well, for non-conductors, we should have the charge distributions, and this is the relation that you should use. So, because every charge on any one of the non-conductor will be at different potentials. So, you have to calculate all those potentials at every point on the non-conductor also, and just write this expression. You, you should be given the potential and the charge distribution. You, should, you need to know both of them. Any questions on this one? Can you say again why we could write um, the other part depends on the conductors similar to the Q1G? Well, let's not write it that way then. I mean, before we, already, we only have the case for point charges, right? So we started from two charges, we generalized it to three charges, and do you agree that this should hold for any number of charges? For any system, u is equal to 1 over 2 sum of qi v at the position of the charge. This is for any charge, any charge distribution, in fact. So whether it is a conductor, non-conductor, this is always valid. If you know the charge distribution, where the charges are, if you know the potentials at those points, this is the total potential energy of the system. So u is equal to 1 over 2 qi vri. Now this sum runs over all the charges in three of the conductors. Now I can divide this sum into three different sums. This is equal to 1 over 2 sum over conductor 1 of qi, the potential at the point ri, plus 1 over 2 sum over all the charges on conductor 2, qi, vri, plus 1 over 2 sum over all the charges on conductor 3, qi, vri. So here I have many terms. I just divide those terms into three parts. One is a sum over all the charges in conductor 1, uh, the other one is a sum over all the charges on conductor 2, and the third one is a sum over all the charges on conductor 3. Now, we had already said that a conductor is an equipotential surface. So, in this sum, all of these VRIs are V1. Sum over conductor 1, QI times V1. Because a conductor, every point on a conductor is at the same potential plus 1 over 2 sum over conductor 2 qi v2 plus 1 over 2 sum over conductor 3 qi v3 
Well, but these are just co constants. They are the same for all the charges in the, inside the given conductor. So I can take V1, V2, V3 out of their sums. But inside that, what remains is the total charge of my conductor. Q1, V1 plus 1 over 2. Q2, V2 plus 1 over 2. Q3, V3. This is the total potential energy of my system. There is one catch. There is one thing that you should pay attention to. Here, in writing these expressions, this V of R1 is the potential created at the position of charge 1. It is created by the other charges, by charge Q2 and Q3. This is the potential created by other charges, Q1 and Q3, and this, is, this Vr3 is the potential created by uh, Q1 and Q2. But I didn't make that distinction over here. Here in this sum, I already said that I measure the potential that all these conductors, this conductor is at V1, this conductor is at potential V2, this is at potential V3. I measure them with all the charges already there. If I remove one charge, of course the potential at this point will be different. But how much different? You see, if you consider one Coulomb charge, we are talking about 10 to the power 19 electrons over there. Well, if you remove one of the electrons out of this 10 to the power 19 electrons, well, then nothing will change in your system. The potential created by all the other charges at this point, at the point of your uh, charge, is more, won't be modified. So this expression still holds to a very high accuracy, as long as you have many, charge, many point charges in your system. So that's just a small catch that you have to pay attention to. It sometimes make a, makes a difference. And you might have a homework on that. Well, there is at least one case where it makes a difference. Now let's look at this thing. Let's imagine a uniformly charged sphere. What is the potential, electric potential energy of this sphere? Let's say the charge density is rho. Well, the potential energy is not a property of the point. It's the energy of the system as a whole. I'm not talking about the potential at a point. I'm talking about the potential energy of the system. Well, let's see. Remember how we first discussed about the potential energy was, suppose we don't have anything and we are bringing all the charges from infinity to their final position. How much work do we have to do? So that is the change in the potential energy. Initially, since we have nothing, there is zero potential energy. So we can say that all the work we have done to bring the charge from infinity to the final position was the potential energy of the system. So let's say that we have, we managed to bring a sphere or ch of charge, let's say small r, from infinity. Let's bring a spherical shell of radius dr what will be the change in the potential energy? Now, if we can calculate this, 
then we can start from small r equal to zero. We bring this very small shell, and then bring the next shell, next shell, next shell, and add all them up, and that will give us the total potential energy of the system, if we can calculate this one. Now, how do we calculate this one? We started from a sphere. What is the potential energy of the, on the surface of this sphere? What is the, not the potential energy, what is the potential on the surface of this sphere? I mean, you see, since we are on the surface, we are looking at the potential on the surface of the sphere, all the charge will behave as if it is located at the center. So it will be the potential created by a point charge at the center, and which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Well, the charge of this my sphere is the charge density times the volume of my sphere. times 1 over r. This is the potential created on the surface of this sphere. Now we know that the potential energy, the change in the potential energy, if we bring an additional charge to this, uh, to this point, will be just this potential multiplied by the charge. Well, if you look, consider this sphere, we are bringing this shell, you can just imagine that we are bringing all these very small parts of the shell. Each one, each one of these small parts, when I bring it over here, it will increase, this, increase the potential energy of the system by this quantity multiplied by the charge of that point. So that all these points eventually come to the same potential. So the net increase in the potential energy of the system when I bring this shell at this point is also modified. So the poten once I bring this one, the potential at this point will be modified due to the presence of this charge over here. But you see, eventually we will take the limit that this charge goes to zero. So the modification at this point will be zero. It will also go to zero, and hence it will not affect my result. In the limit when the dr goes to zero, this will be correct. Well, let's write du. This is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. I have rho squared. I have 4 pi squared over 3. I have r to the 4 times dr. Uh, if you just consider the factors, I have 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. I have a 4 pi over here, another 4 pi over here. That is 4 pi squared. I have a 1 over 3. And then I have a row here, another row from here, row squared. R, R squared from here, another R squared from here. That is R to the 4. Yeah, the next thing is just integrate. The potential goes from 0 to the total potential of the system and r goes from 0 to the final radius. Well, this 4 pi will cancel one of these, so u will be equal to 4 pi over 3 epsilon 0, rho squared, r to the 5 divided by 5, r from 0 up to the radius. Or this will be 4 pi over 15 epsilon 0, rho squared r to the 5. Well, let's, let's do one more step. Let's express this instead of rho, let's use the total charge of the system. u is equal to 4 pi over 15 epsilon 0. Now rho is charge per unit volume. I have a total charge Q distributed over the volume 4 over 3 pi r cube. This thing squared r to the 5.
this is equal to 4 pi over 15 epsilon 0 q squared over r 1 over 4 pi squared times 9 so this 4 pi will cancel I have a 3 there is a 5 this is equal to 3 over 5 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q squared over r Well, this is called the self energy of this system. Now, in fact, if you consider, for example, R goes to zero, you see that this diverges. So, if you try to mod model a unit charge, a point charge, a point charge with some charge Q, a point charge is, you can think of it as a sphere with zero radius, so it has infinite self energy. True. Uh, this this shell is like a uh, test, test charge. Yes. Well, in fact, even this shell I divided into a collection of test charges, but all of the test charges are at the same potential. That is why I could still use this expression, although it was not a point test charge. You use the potential and the test charge to find potential energy. True. Because potential times the test charge is the change in the potential energy of the system as we bring the test charge from infinity to the, its final point. The, what do you mean, the physics? Here. First of all, is it clear that the potential energy or electrostatic potential energy of the system we define as the work that we have to do if we want to bring all these charges from infinity to their final configuration? That is how we define the energy. Well, in fact, that is how we define the change in the potential energy. And we just fix the initial potential energy to be zero. So then what we did, let's just, we said that let's imagine we don't have anything. We bring this infinitesimal sphere first one. Then we bring a shell. We do some work. Then we bring another shell. We do some more work. Then we bring one more shell. We do some more work. So we said that rather than calculating the total work, let's calculate the work that we have to do if we want to add one more shell. We assume that we already brought some of the charges forming a sphere of radius small r. And we are imagining that we are bringing bringing in one more shell of thickness dr. So how much work do we have to do? Now if you bring this one more uh, shell of dr, as your friend pointed out, we are kind of, we have a system which creates a potential on the surface and we are bringing a test charge on the surface. And the potential times the test charge, the charge of the test charge, is the change in the potential energy of the system. So this is the change in the potential energy of the system. Is this is the initial charge, initial potential at the point of my, at the position of my test charge. This is one over four pi epsilon zero q over r times the charge of my test charge. And the next question is, what is the charge of my test charge? Because in this case, although I'm not bringing a point charge, since all the points on this shell are at this going to the same potential, I can treat everything as a test charge. So the charge of this shell is nothing but the volume of the shell. Well, the volume of the shell is nothing but the area times the thickness times the charge density. This is the Q. So I just put this over here to obtain the work that I had to do or the increase in the potential energy as I bring this additional shell. This is du is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Well, if you just multiply this factor with this one, this is what you obtain. And then we said that, okay, this is just one shell, so we have to sum from zero shell up to the final, all the shells. So that is nothing but the integration. So we integrated, and this was the final answer.
and this is the final potential energy. And then we said that if you try to apply it for a point charge, for example, electron, we say that electron is a point charge. Well, a point charge has a charge and a zero radius, so this is infinite. So there seems to be some inconsistency in our approach. It gives infinite self-energy. But this inconsistency, let's say, it survives. I mean, there, we, we, there is no resolution to that. But it's also not relevant. Because, for example, electron, we are saying point charges, but we are not creating electrons anyway. We are just taking electrons as a whole. And the only thing that matters for us are changes in the energy. So if the energy is, if you add an infinite constant to an energy, of course it will not look nice, but it will not change the differences. So as long as the differences are finite, so you just bring an electron from here to here, the work that you do or the change in the potential energy of the system will be finite, there is no problem for us. Any questions? Okay, so the stress moment. <laughs> I do that and then you start leaving when I say quiz. After the quiz, you can leave. <laughs>